Welcome, welcome. Everyone joining us online as well. We welcome you from wherever you are. Come on, church, let them know you're grateful that they're watching. Come on. Let us know where you're watching from in the chats. We'd love to celebrate you wherever you're at. We're in part two of this series called Legacy. Legacy, we're studying kind of the themes of Nehemiah. If you missed part one, you got to go check that out. It's online. It's on YouTube. It'll catch you up to where we're at today. But this guy, Nehemiah, is just an amazing man of God, a man of destiny who kind of, who left a legacy that's modeling something for us. This guy was in, let me just catch you up because it is important that we understand the context today. Nehemiah is like this right-hand guy of King Xerxes, the, the Persian king. He's like this prime minister guy. And he's in this uh, citadel called Susa. He's like living it up. I'm telling you, it's the king's uh, estate. And he's, he's, he's got a good job. He's got a good career. He's got a probably a good home. He's setting himself up. And the Lord calls him to move to Jerusalem to rebuild the, the walls of of the God, of God's people in God's, in God's city. And which is kind of, it's crazy. It's almost counterintuitive because you think about leaving a legacy, right? Leaving a legacy. It seems like Nehemiah is leaving the thing that would be the legacy, right? In our mindset, at least, it's like, man, no way. He's got a great job. He's like, he's got a great home. He's got a great, he's got a lot of money. He's probably making some money. He's setting himself up and his kids up. Man, that's like, wow, what a legacy. That dude's like, second in command and stuff. And he leaves all of that to go to the rubbles and the ruins in the burnt down city of disgraceful Jerusalem. And it almost is counterintuitive. Here's what I need you to see in this legacy series is that the things that we put a value on aren't always the things that God puts a value on. The legacy that God wants you to leave might not be the legacy that you are it might not be the life that you are building right now. That God may have you remove your hand from some things. Oh, um, listen. God may have you remove some of your commitments, some of the energy and the drive and what you are trying to build so that you can actually build his kingdom. So Jesus said in Mark chapter 8, Jesus says, what good is it if, if a man has the whole world and forfeits his soul? What good is it? What profit does it if we would gain all of the status and the promotions and the prestige and, and the stuff of this world, but the legacy we hand off? See, God, that stuff is not important in what's valuable to the legacy of our children and their children and the generations that are going to come through us and after us. The real legacy is a legacy of godliness. It's a legacy of God's people and a legacy of God's kingdom. And Nehemiah recognizes this. He's, he's comfortable. He's in a great position. He's got a great career. But his heart is broken for the things that are breaking God's heart, for God's people and God's kingdom. And he's, he's praying and fasting for four months. And we studied this last week. And after four months, he's like, he gets an audience with the king. And, and God has given him favor. We cannot underscore the amount of favor that God has given Nehemiah after four months of prayer and fasting, because this king of Persia hears the request of Nehemiah to rebuild, listen to me, to rebuild an enemy nation's defenses, the walls of an, of an enemy nation. And he goes, sure, Nehemiah, what else do you need? I need, I need like three years off. Sure, Nehemiah, what else do you need? I need like timber and stuff. And like, okay, let me write you some letters, whatever you need. Like that alone is a miracle, you guys, that God opened the doors for his kingdom, his people, and to bless the work of Nehemiah because of the burden he had for God's kingdom and God's people. We're going to pick it up today in Nehemiah chapter 2. He's already had the audience with the king and has now been sent back to Jerusalem. Nehemiah chapter 2 says, I went to Jerusalem. Again, this is Nehemiah's hand, right? That's why it's called the book of Nehemiah. He's writing this. It's his perspective. I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there for three days, I set out during the night. And this is something common in Nehemiah. Not only does he wait four months to talk to the king, but he doesn't go there and start changing stuff and be like, okay, guys, let's just. No, no, he kind of, he goes there, and he prays, and he waits three days. He takes a few others 
out with him. He says, I hadn't told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding. So it was no horses. I was the only one on a horse, he said. By night, I went out through the valley gate toward the jackal well and the dung gate. Probably not a popular place in the city, you know, just guessing. It's probably not a place that you'd want your home or your, you know. I live near dung. That's where I live. Take a ride at dung gate, you know, just saying. Examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved toward the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my horse, my mount, to get through. So he says I had to, I had to get off, and I went up to the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and re-entered the valley gate. The officials didn't know where I'd gone or or what I was doing, because they because as yet. I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or the nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. Then after that, after days and prayer and research and looking, he says, then I said to them, you see, guys, can't you see the trouble we're in? Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Now, let me ask you a question. Could, did they not... Could they not see what was happening around them? Were they blind to it? Did they not know that they were in ruins? No, they did. They they were there. They could could see it. Come, he says, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. Here's what I want you to see, you guys. That the ruins became regular to their life. That, That the ruins that they were living in became normative. It became what their regular life experiences. See, sometimes your familiarity with the broken walls is your biggest obstacle to rebuilding. See, here is Nehemiah in Susa, an amazing citadel. He's got this outward perspective of what uh, life could be. And he steps into this messed up state Jerusalem is in. And he sees the brokenness in the, in the walls and the, in, in the, the ruins. And he goes, guys, this is disgraceful. And here they are living among the muck and they got so comfortable living in it that they couldn't even see, they couldn't even smell the smoke anymore because they were used to it. And listen to me, here's, here's what I want you to see is your familiarity. Some of you have no outside input. Some, the only people you have speaking into your marriage is the dude that's got a worse marriage than you. The only person that is, about, is providing counsel or you're opening your life up to counsel is the guy who don't even go to church. It's someone who doesn't even know the word of God more than you know the word of God. It's like you're all in the ruins and wondering... And you need, what you need is a new revelation. What you need is a new perspective, is your eyes to be open to what could be. Let me give you an example. A few years into, actually just a little over a year into our marriage, Veronica and I, we loved Jesus with all of our heart, man. Had a calling. We loved each other so much. Desperately loved each other. But we did not know how to have a healthy marriage. We did not know how to have a godly family, like a God-honoring marriage and family. Jesus was our Lord, but our parents were still in our genes. How many of you know what I'm talking about, okay? So like, like the habits of your history and your upbringing and what was taught to you, the legacy that you received, you're like repeating patterns now in your marriage and in your communication and in your family and in your conflict. And, and so we got just over a year into our marriage and we're going, man, like this is not what I want. I don't want to say this to you. I don't want to, we have to keep apologizing for things that we didn't even want to say or didn't want to do. And so we had to invite an outside perspective into the ruins of our situation. And in a little over a year into our marriage, we did. We got some biblical counsel and advice and we went to a counselor and this counselor was, he was amazing. He affirmed our calling, affirmed our love for each other and for God. But he said, I need you guys to acknowledge something, that what you guys experienced when, in your family when you were raised, I need you to acknowledge something, that it's not normal. It's not normal. Now, now he wasn't meaning like, 
normal as in normative as, as like not everyone is doing this. Because in fact, 78 to 80% of Americans say that they grew up in a family that was dysfunctional. So he wasn't meaning like normal as in not a lot of people are going through it. He was talking about the normal as in this isn't God's plan for your life. This isn't, this, you have to reject that thing, that how you were raised and what you were taught as something that was outside of the plan of God and not be part of your normal experience that you perpetuate into the next generation, into your children. 70 to 80% of Americans say that they were raised in a dysfunctional home. And if you're here today and you're part of that minority of the 20 to 30% that was not a dysfunctional home, it might be hard for you to realize or to even think about a family that does not emotionally connect or communicate to each other in healthy ways. But unfortunately, dysfunction is very common in our families today. And, and what happens is healthy relationships are hard to spot when you're raised in that kind of dysfunction. And it's proven time and time again that family ties are fundamental to our emotional and psychological makeup. And, and when dysfunction and estrangement is considered normal, children from these homes and environments grow up and often just repeat the cycle. And so here we are, we're like repeating the cycle of the ruins that we're living in. And, and some of you don't know, you can't smell the smoke anymore, that your marriage is on fire. Your children are in desperate need. Your, your family, your, your faith, your, your faith is like not as strong as you thought it was. It's like it does, the walls are not built. It's not. So many people, like it, this was exposed through COVID and pandemic because a lot of people, they, had, they, they rested their faith on a Sunday attendance thing. And so when that it wasn't there, it just, it just revealed the desperate state that the walls of our faith were actually leaning on that something that just one day was taken out of it, that my entire faith and relationship God, with God was resting on. What, listen, what will be your legacy? What will you leave when you leave? Will you leave a better family? Will you leave a better marriage? Will you have better traditions and better values? Or will it be broken walls? The people responded to Nehemiah in, in a way that I'm in, what I'm encouraging you to do is respond today to this, to this call to rebuild, to the call to leaving a legacy. In Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 20, the people responded and they said, the God of heaven has appointed us for his purpose. They said, hey, we're not here by accident. We're here on purpose. We are here appointed by God for such a time as this and will give us success. Therefore, we, his servants, will say this out loud. One, two, three, arise. Come on, that's what you need to do today. Arise from the ashes of the broken state that our families are in. Arise from the desperate state that our, your, our marriages are in. Our family, our faith that are in. Choose, arise and rebuild. Can I get an amen, somebody? Amen. How do we do it? How do we arise from the brokenness that our that our situation is in, the broken walls of whatever domains that, that have been broken and torn and in despair, how do we arise from this place and rebuild? Nehemiah shows us a few things. Write these down. Number one, you got to start here. Get the facts first. Like get the facts first. Because sometimes you'll hear a message and then you just, or, or you read something or hear something and you go, you're going to go home back. all right, this is how we're going to fix it. This is what we're going to do. We're going to and you just, without any of the facts of like, what's really the problem or listen, or how much you're even contributing to the problem, sir, ma'am. And you don't have the facts of the situation. What you need to do is actually get, the, this is what Nehemiah did. This is like, he, he not only waited four months to talk to the king, but he waited several days to research and to investigate the walls for himself. He personally inspected with just a small party the situation, and, and, and every good leader knows what he's doing. He's doing his homework. He's not taking a secondhand information about the problem and the situation. He's going investigating himself. You got to get the facts right. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 23 tells us as much. Get the facts. Like at any price, you got to get the real, like what is happening. Not just because it's a, you read it, not just because it was on the news, or not just because your pastor is saying it. You got to get down in the rubble. And get the facts at any price and hold on tightly to all, that it, all the good sense that you can get. 
So why is he being so secretive, Nehemiah, for three days in a survey? Because he didn't want his plans to be stalled. Like, like before he's even out of the starting gate. See, sometimes you got to protect your plans from a premature death. Sometimes you, you just got to get all the facts first before you go and say, this is all, this is what, you don't even have, you don't even know what the problem is. You don't know why the walls are broken in your marriage, in your faith, in your home, in your children. You don't know why you're in the situation you're in. And what you need to do is get the facts. Now look, this is, this is the secret, how Nehemiah did it. In verse 14, the verses we just read, it says that there was so much rubble that he had to get off his horse and walk through it. And it's at that point, I think, that the size of the project begins to get, you're like, he's probably thinking, oh my goodness, what did I get myself into? Like, I, how am I going to, like, fix this? I've never built anything in my life. There was not enough room through the rubble to ride on a horse through. So here's, here's I think, what Nehemiah is saying. As I was reading, here's what I believe God is saying to us. At some point, you got to get off your high horse and get down in the rubble and get the facts. Sometimes, at some point, hey, because maybe everything, oh, we're fine. We're fine, pastor. Marriage is good. We're good. Family's good. Kids are good. Everything's good. Is it really good? Maybe on your horse it's good, but if you would just get off that thing and get into the rubble that your kids are playing with, it may look good from your perspective, but the kids are playing in the ruins. They're playing in the broken walls. Okay, at some point, like, you got to, if you're going to leave a legacy, you got to get off your high horse, grab the hands of your children, and look in their eyes and say, I'm sorry. This is not okay. This is, this is not okay. I should not yell like that. Hey, dad should never lose his temper like that. I'm so sorry. Come on, I'm speaking to someone here today. Hey, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I haven't modeled for you what a man of God looks like. I have a model for you what a woman of God looks like. I have a model for you the waiters that we're to love and communicate to each other. Hey, I'm sorry. That's not okay. It's not okay. You got to get up. Man and woman of God, if you want to leave a legacy, you got to get off your high horse. Humble yourself. and Look at the facts in the face. Humble yourself. If you want to leave a legacy. You can, oh, I'm, I'm talking about a legacy, you guys, a godly legacy, something that is different, that doesn't perpetuate brokenness and despair and dysfunction and toxicity to our children. Like, we're not going to pass it. If you want something different, get off of your horse, get down in the rubble, grab your kid's hands and say, it's going to change and it's going to start in me. I'm going to change first. That's why number two, number two. You just got to choose to start. Choose to start rebuilding. I know it looks like a lot. Look, your life is never going to change just by information. Your life is not going to change by you getting the facts, doing the research, getting into the rubble. It's not going to change. Information does not change your life. Your life is changed by action. By action you got to do something with what God has revealed to you. And, and listen, all action, all action is, is fathered or mothered by a decision. When you decide something, your life changes when you decide something. The moment you decide to start rebuilding today, you can, listen, you are one decision away from changing your life, changing your legacy. When you decide something, it changes something whatever has stopped you before today i'm telling you like maybe it's fear that has stopped you from starting this rebuilding process or time or money or energy or awareness or thinking you're not enough put that aside and just decide to start start rebuilding but jason there's so much mess there's so much junk there's so much history i understand that but just start look zechariah chapter 4 verse 10 this is actually, a lot of you may know this verse, but Zechariah was a prophet during the time of the returning exiles. So this was, he was a prophet that was in prophetic office, making declaration during the context of what we're communicating. I just, it's just really cool because you know this verse, but you may not apply it to the context of this stage of, of exile and the returning from exile. Here's what Nehemiah, or Zechariah said. He said, do not despise these small beginnings. For the Lord rejoices just to see you get started. 
So here's what he's saying. This is, it's, the Lord just rejoices in seeing the temple getting rebuilt and the walls getting rebuilt. And I understand it looks like a lot. And it looks like you can't do it. And it looks like it's impossible. But God just loves it when you pick up one brick and get started. Just one brick. Just choose to get started today. Like start rebuilding. I know it's hard to clean up the mess and leave a legacy worth leaving. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. Everybody would be leaving a godly legacy onto their children, but they're not, because it's, it's not easy, but everything that God has for you is not easy. Everything, like everything God has for you is uphill. Everything worthwhile is, is uphill. Everything you want, everything you desire, everything you want to receive from life is uphill. The problem is most of us have uphill hopes Uphill dreams and down, downhill habits. So, hey, and it, and it don't take any energy at all to go downhill. You can roll downhill. You can slide downhill. You can slip downhill. It doesn't take any concentration or effort or determination or skill set. It doesn't take anything to go downhill. It happens naturally. But everything God has for you is uphill. And to go uphill takes determination. It takes consistency, it takes energy, it takes drive, it takes you staying the course and focusing on what lies ahead of you, not the ruins that your current situation is, but looking ahead of it and saying, I'm going to keep going because this wall is getting rebuilt in Jesus' name. Amen. Get to work, decide today. Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 6 tells us, Nehemiah says, so we built the wall. And all the walls are joined together to half its height. So here they are at this point, Nehemiah 4. They're halfway. Why? For the people had a mind to work. I love that. They had a mind to work. If you want to leave a legacy, you have to have a mind to work. Not a mind to complain. Not a mind to criticize. Not a, listen, it's easy. It doesn't take any energy or any effort. It doesn't take any intellect for you to criticize or complain about your current situation and why you're in what you're in and why other people are contributing to what you're in. It takes no energy or effort or determination for you to complain about it. You need, if you want to leave a legacy, you got to have a mind to work. And I'm telling you right now, you can't stop me from building a legacy. The devil can't stop me because I got a mind to work. I'm going to keep working. I'm going to keep building. I'm going I'm to, come on somebody, get to work. Just start rebuilding. Just start, just start rebuilding. Keep growing, keep believing, keep working. And then number three, he tells us, you got to expect opposition along the way too. Expect opposition. Uh, the fact is, the moment you say, let's do something, someone else is going to jump up and say, let's not. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's like the moment, the moment you, God tells you, let's arise and rebuild, the devil says, let's arise and stop them. That's exactly, I promise you, every time that you are choosing to to rebuild and arise, there is going to be opposition with it. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 19, as they began this work, this is just an idea stage and dream casting and let's do it right from the get-go, opposition. When Sambalot, the Horonite, Tobiah, the Ammonite official, and Geshub, the Arab, heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed this. They said, what is this that you're doing? Are they trying to rebel against the king? He names two of these leaders, Sambalot, he's kind of the governor of, of Samaria, and Tobiah is the leader of the Ammonites. And he names two, like, and what I want you to see today, like next week I'm going to tell you how to and teach you how to handle opposition, like a whole week dedicated to how do you handle the, the strategic warfare against you and your legacy. But today I just want you to, to understand this, to expect that there will be opposition. And in fact, opposition never stops. It will never, you will never be, as long as you are serving God and advancing his purposes and his kingdom and his legacy and destiny for your life, opposition will never stop. In fact, there is no opportunity without opposition. Do you hear me? There is no opportunity without opposition. 
When he had the idea to rebuild, there was opposition. And then when they started the rebuilding process, Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 1, I just want you to show you, all throughout the process, there's opposition. Nehemiah chapter 4, when Sambalot heard that they were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed, and he ridiculed them at that point. During times of opposition, that's the time where we choose often to stop, where we choose to give up. Or maybe you say, I'm going to take a break. Let's just take a break. Let's just take a break. Let's take a pause for, for, for a moment. That's exactly what the enemy wants. He wants to stop your progress, to stop your legacy. Toward the end of the rebuilding project in Nehemiah chapter 6, they had actually plotted to kill Nehemiah, to get him off the wall, to get him into a secret meeting so that they could actually just kill and stop the Jews from rebuilding the, the nation. When Sambalot, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall and that there were no more breaks in it, even though he hadn't installed the gate, so it wasn't fully complete, Sambalot and, the, and Geshem sent this message, come and meet with us at Kephirim. It wasn't like he already knew the plot. In the valley of Ono, that's what tipped him off. It was, oh no. <laughs> Bible jokes, you know what I mean? I knew they were scheming to hurt me, so I sent messengers back with this. And here's what I'm encouraging you today. Say, to say when the opposition comes, I'm doing a great work, I can't come down. Here, expect opposition. So right now, what I want you to do, right now, I want you to pre-decide. Pre-decide. When it comes, because it will come, I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to pause. Oh, I think I just can't serve in this season. I can't get involved in a group this season. Oh, I, just, I think I just need to peel back a little bit in my purpose, in my calling, in my destiny. Nope, I'm pre-deciding right now. Opposition's going to come, but I'm doing a great work, and I'm not coming down. Come on, give God some praise right there if you agree. All right, I know. I'm preaching loud today. I'm just excited about this, okay? Number four, number four, if you want to arise and rebuild, don't try to do it alone. Don't try. Don't, don't do it. Another, another verse that's actually in this, it's not in your notes, but in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, you may want to write that down. It's a, again, Zechariah is a prophet in this time of exiles returning to Jerusalem. It's a verse that some of you may know, but again, in the context of returning exiles, like this is the context. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6 says this. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So here's, Zechariah was actually talking about the rebuilding of God's kingdom when he was talking about that. When he said that, and that verse applies to a lot of situations, not by, by, but not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. But here's what Zechariah, in the context, he was saying, look, I know there's a lot to rebuild. I know there's, it looks like it's dark. It looks like the world is against us. It looks, it's so discouraging. It's so broken and messed up. But listen, it is, you're not going to do it alone. It's not by your might. It's not by your power, but it's by God's spirit, says the Lord. Don't try to do this Alone, you cannot leave a godly legacy without God's help. You can, and listen, and you can't leave a godly legacy without God's people. You, you can't. You, you cannot leave out others. That's, it's, I'm telling you, that wall is too big for you to build it alone. That, that, the kingdom of God is too great for you to build it alone. Nehemiah chapter 3 so just after Nehemiah shares this vision with the leaders and he does his inspection and he goes out on his horse, climbs off and looks at everything, comes back, shares the vision with them. And they say, let's arise and rebuild. Then they start getting to work. I want you to notice in Nehemiah chapter 3, how many times it says next to him. How many times the families worked and there was another family next to them. It says then, and I'm going to try to get all these names right. There are so many weird names in this section. Then Eliashib the high priest rose up with his brothers and the priests, and they built the sheep gate. They consecrated it and set its doors. They consecrated it as far as the Tower of the Hundred, as far as the Tower of Hananel. And next to him, just notice this, the men of Jericho built. And next to them, Zachar, the son of Imri, built. The sons of Hassan, Hassanah built the fish gate. They laid its beams and set its doors, its bolts and bars. And next to them, Merimoth, the son of Uriah, the son of Hakos, repaired. And next to them, Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, and the son of Babashamana, 
I just spoke in tongues right now. And the son of Meshezebel repaired. <laughs> the next section, Zadok, the son of Banna repaired. So, so I just, I want you to see that what you need to see is like every family, they took care of one section and next to them, another family. And next to them, here's what I want you to know. You can't do it alone. You need some brothers standing next to you. You need some sisters standing next to you. You need another married couple. You need a family standing next to you. You were not called to do it alone. Well, Pastor, I, I'm not doing it alone. That's why I'm here. I, I get it. You're here, but you didn't put in the work. Okay? You may have received a good word, but you didn't contribute to any of it. I love you. I love you. I love you. I'm your pastor, and I love you. But I'm just, I'm trying to call something out of you that's greater. You, you are not... That's why here at Discovery, we call it like worshiping one and serving one because we're not called to do it alone. Like you come and you worship and you receive, but then you actually stay for another service at some point and serve somebody else and help build God's kingdom. Amen, somebody? So, so yeah, I get you're here, but that's not like you don't really know people and can't get to know people intimately. No, we disciple people here at Discovery in teams and groups. That's where, that's where you are going to get discipled. That's where you are going to be known. That's where you're going to be cared for. That's where you're not doing it alone. Don't fall for the trap that you're actually part of something by attending on a Sunday. You're, no, this is, this is, I'm glad you're here and I love that you're here. But as you are here and you can take your time. But my whole goal as you are here and hearing the word of God is to usher you and lead you closer and closer to Jesus. Little by little, closer and closer, getting into community, using your gifts, um, becoming who God has called you to be. You are not going to do that alone. Nehemiah chapter 3, verse 5. This last family in their section, it says, next, the next section was repaired by the men of Tekoa. But check this out. But their nobles would not put their shoulders to the work under their supervisors. So these guys were too noble to put their shoulder to the work for God's people in God's kingdom. They were too important to serve on the wall, to move a brick. They, they were too busy to do any of the, the work of God's people in God's kingdom. And maybe, you know, that's for them to do. I mean, I got, I'm a noble. I got, I got, you know, this going on. I got this going on. And they can... They can greet people at the door. They can pray for kids in kids' ministry. They can maybe park a car, but, but I'm, not me. Are you seeing this, you guys? Okay, this is the legacy that these men left. Like their names are written in the scriptures forever as people who would not put their shoulders to the work. Okay? And I'm telling you, like, you cannot, you cannot leave a godly legacy. If you try to do it alone, we need each other. We need each other. Let me give you three reasons today why you need to rebuild, rebuild those walls that God is revealing to you. And I've been praying for you all week that God would reveal to you some of those broken walls that you got comfortable with. You, that you, you, that smoke, <laughs> you, you couldn't, you can't even smell the smoke anymore of the things on fire in your life because you got so, so comfortable. I remember as a, as a kid, I, one of my buddies, you know, I go over to his house all the time, all, and he'd never been to my house. And um, he had come over a few times, and he actually told me, like, Man, Pat, he, Jason, I just love hanging out. Your house is always so clean. And I'm like, clean? What are you talking about? You ain't clean. He's like, no, it always smells so good. And, and so what, what we figured out was that um, his mom and dad both smoked, and he never knew an environment of home that didn't smoke. And so he was just like, this, it, smell, it smells different. Here's what I'm saying. He's like, some of you, you're in the smoke so much that you don't even know you need work. You don't even know that you need work. You need other people in your life for three reasons. Number one, I need others to walk with me. You need some people to walk with you. What does that mean? It means you need some people to help you grow spiritually. Colossians chapter 2 says it like this. Just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, so now walk in him. You know, the Bible compares our life to a walk often. Why? Because you're on a journey. 
through life. You're not in like a standstill. You're not where you where you used to be, and you're not where you're going to be. You're on a you're on a journey. And throughout the Bible, we're encouraged to like walk in wisdom, to walk in the spirit, to walk in obedience, to walk as Jesus walked. All throughout the scriptures, it tells us how to walk. But one of the key ways that God tells us how to walk is when he says, don't walk alone. You are not called to walk alone through life. Proverbs 28, 28 says, it is foolish to follow your own opinions. Like your own thoughts, be safe and follow the teachings of some wiser people. Get some wise counsel around you that isn't in the same mess, the same brokenness. Get some wisdom around you in your life. Don't walk alone. Don't do it alone. It's not in your notes, but you may want to write it down. Because community is God's answer to loneliness. So, so what's the antidote here? What's the antidote to this, this, you know, others walking with me. It's, it's two groups. It's a physical family and a spiritual family. Like, you need a physical family. I'm burning up up here. The AC's turned off. Someone better help me out. Come on, somebody. These errors are going to get turned on in Jesus' name right now. Come on. <laughs> AC flow in Jesus' name. And I'm going to call that out before I start sweating like a pig up here. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Okay. Mm. Okay. Two groups, your physical family and your spiritual family. Listen, your physical family is the one you got when you were, when you were born, right? Your spiritual family is, is the one that's going to be with you forever. Listen, your physical family is, is meant to and designed to dissolve, to grow further apart. To, we, we die, we pass away, we move away. The kids are going to grow up and fall in love with someone else and forget about you, Okay. And come see you less and less and less and less. That's just going to happen. That's physical family. We grow up, we separate, we die. Okay? Listen, but your spiritual family will remain forever and ever and ever. So God says, I want you to connect to my family. Uh, th yes, the physical family is important, but so is your spiritual family that you need to connect to a spiritual family, God's church. Hebrews chapter 10, 25 says, let us not give up meeting together. Let, let us not give up the habit of meeting together. Instead, let us encourage one another. That verse is not talking about what we're doing right now. This is not community, guys. This is a crowd. You can't connect and encourage everybody and know everybody in a crowd. You need a small group to walk along. We started our small groups just a few weeks ago here at Discovery Church. And if you want to leave a legacy, and this is something you're serious about, you want to rebuild some walls? I even talked about like, like me going to biblical advice and count. Anytime I talk about counseling and like getting some biblical advice, I get flooded with emails and, and, and connection cards and, okay, pastor, I'm ready. No, 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 no. Listen, here, let me help you out. N not everyone, everyone rebuilding the walls didn't go, Nehemiah, we're going to want to work next to you. Everyone get, gather around Nehemiah and let's work. No, it was one family working next to the next family, and the next family, next family, next family. God wants to use all of us. I'm not the answer to all of your problems. I love you. I pray for you. I make time as much as, but I'm one man. What we need is to rebuild together. Get, and this is how you do it. Get into a group. Get into a group. Get honest. Get real. Let some people know you. Let some people in. That's how you do it. The pastor doesn't have all the answers, okay? And I am only one man and can't do it. This is where it happens. This is where it happens. Don't do it alone. Let others start walking with you, okay? I'm one man. I can't walk with everybody. I, can only, I am one person. Only the Holy Spirit can walk with every single one of you, number one. And number two, you need a few friends in your life to walk with. You find those in small groups, all right? Are y'all hearing me? I love you, but I just can't walk with everybody, okay? I can't do it. Number two, here's number two. I need others not only to walk with me, I need others to work with me. I need others to work with me. I need people, like the Bible says that God put you on earth to do a certain work that only you can do. Do you know that? In fact, it says that he predetermined the work, like it was, it was made in advance, and you were created and fashioned by God uniquely and intentionally to do the very things he called you to do. Isn't that amazing? Like God created you unique for accomplishing a purpose that can only be accomplished through you. Like you got to work, but you're not called to do it alone. Ephesians chapter 4, 16 actually tells us that each part, as each part does its own special work. He's talking about the body of Christ here. 
as each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Like we do it together. That's why, not in your notes, write it down. Community is God's answer to burnout. Community is God's answer to fatigue and, and terror. Like, like a lot of you today, like you are so tired. Some of you are, you came into this place exhausted. You know why? Because you're trying to do it alone. You're trying to carry it all alone. You're trying to figure out the answer alone. You're trying to get the solution alone. In fact, some of you, you're carrying your, you're the only one that knows the problem. No one else knows how broken the walls are. Only you do and you're carrying that all yourself and it's tiring and it's exhausting. Community is God's answer to that burnout because God never meant you to go through life walking alone and working alone. You need to be in relationship with other people. Ecclesiastes chapter four, verse nine says, two people are better than one because they get more done by what? Working together, they get more done. Everybody knows this, you get more done as a team then as an individual, a snowflake is frail by itself, but uh, you get enough of them to stick together, you can stop traffic, right? Okay, number three, that went over some of your head, all right? Number three, <laughs> snow, what's snow? Uh, I need others not only to walk with me, work with me, but I need others to watch out for me. I'm talking about people who will defend me, who will stand up for me, who will protect me. Philippians chapter two, verse four tells us to look out for one another's interests not just your own. If you want a counterculture verse, that's it right there. Like, because every one of us, like we are, we are conditioned in our American culture to just worry about ourselves. You, do you remember Neighborhood Watch? It used to be a thing. You see Neighborhood Watch signs and stuff. And whenever you see the Neighborhood Watch sign, they're still around a little bit. But when you see a Neighborhood Watch sign, it says that's a community that's looking out for one another, right? And sometimes like if you're going on a vacation, maybe a long vacation, you, you probably, tell, if you got a good relationship with your neighbors, you tell them like, hey, I'm going to going be gone for a couple weeks. Can you watch out for my house? Can you keep an eye out for, for my, my stuff? Like, like, can you watch out? But my question is not just, is anybody watching out for your stuff? My question today is, anybody watching out for your soul? Like, your, your soul is a whole, a whole lot more important than your stuff? Is there anybody in your life who is helping you stay on track spiritually? Is there anybody in your life who loves you enough to say, I'm not going to let you stay discouraged. No, I'm not going to let you give up. No, no. What do you mean? You're, how, what's God saying to you in the word? You're not in your word? Come on, man. Hey, I haven't seen you for a little bit at church. I haven't seen you for a little bit at groups. No, you need to. Don't, you're not giving up. You need some people who are watching out for your soul because there is an enemy that is real. He seeks to steal kill and destroy and alone we are no match but together we can defeat him in nehemiah chapter 4 they had a plan for the opposition for the opposition against them nehemiah he's like he's he knows that people are out to get him the enemy is undermining the work of god's kingdom and he said to the nobles the officials and the rest of the people the work is extensive and spread out. We're widely separated. Here's what he's saying. You're working on this wall. You're working on that wall. I mean, your family's over here in community and doing stuff, building God's kingdom, but I'm over here and doing stuff. And we all have our unique role, our unique fit, working on different things, and it's widely separated from each other along the wall. So here's the plan. Whenever you hear the sound of the trumpet, whenever you hear, and the trumpet was the call for help, join us there and our God will fight for us. So here was the plan. He said, look, when the enemy comes, when I ask for help, when I say, hey, I'm getting depressed, when, 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 when I get attacked, when, when, when my marriage is under fire, when, I, when I've lost my job and I say, Can, and when I blow the trumpet, will you rally around me? Can I get you to rally around me in my time of need? Because I can't do it alone. Here's, here's the thing though, you guys, you need to see. No one's coming if you don't sound the trumpet. No one's coming if you don't let, so if you don't blow, hey, this hurts. Hey, I'm suffering. Hey, my marriage. Hey, my kids. Hey, my financial situation. Hey, my health. Hey, like I'm battling with some thoughts here. Can you rally? Can you rally around me? Because I can't do this alone. Some of you, you're here today and the enemy's been beating you up and you even feel defeated today. But this is, 
another reason why you can't do it alone. Write it down. Community is God's answer to defeat. It's God's answer to, to the defeat that we experience alone and isolated without any trumpet to sound, without any friends or community or brothers or sisters to say, come to my aid. Let the Lord fight for us together. Community is God's answer. To defeat, and I promise you, if you don't get it, you can't do it alone. If you try to do this alone, you will lose. Let me say it this way you will never leave a legacy if you try to do it alone. You will never build the walls to at least the glory of those walls that God has called His kingdom and His kingdom citizens to have the glory of His people, the glory of His kingdom that you'll never see it if you try to build it alone. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 12 a person standing alone can be attacked and defeated. And I know I've been praying for you this week. Some of you, that's you. You're alone. And you're feeling attacked. And you're feeling defeated. And you don't need to be. You don't need to be. Because two can stand back to back and we can change the we can change the narrative, man. We can change the outcome of this thing. We can conquer together. Three or even better for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. Come on, will you bow your heads? I want to pray over every single one of you today because we're going to make a choice. A choice today to begin with every head bow, every eye closed. You're here today and, and, and maybe you thought it was okay, but you realize there are some things that are just not okay. They're not okay. You got comfortable in some areas. You got complacent, maybe indifferent in some areas, but there is broken walls. There is things on fire in your life and you need to get off that horse. God, right now, we're humbling ourselves. We're lowering ourselves. God, we need you. We need your help to restore the walls of our family, of our marriage, of our faith, of the kingdom. God, help us. Help us rebuild. Give us success in rebuilding. God, we're going to decide today. We're choosing today to start. We're going to start today and rebuild. And it's going to start right here in me. Do it in me first, Jesus. Rebuild me. Change me. With every head bowed and eye closed. If you've never said something like that, invited Jesus to change you. That's actually what, like, salvation is a, a, a first a prayer of saying, Jesus, I surrender. I surrender. And some of you have never said that before. You've never given Jesus your life. That's what salvation is, where you just give the control to Him. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, then you shall be saved. That's it, man. That can happen. You get a fresh start right here and right now. Some of you have never made that decision, and maybe you're going to make that for the very first time right here. Some of you need to make it again right now. I'm not going to have you come up to the front or single you out, but I want you to just, in just a moment, I'm going to count to three, and I'd love for you to lift your hand if you're in the house. If you're online, just type in, I need Jesus on the count of three if you're ready to start rebuilding and give Jesus the control of your life today. Come on, one, two, three. I surrender God. Lift up that hand. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. I surrender God all over this place. Yes, yes, yes. Amen. 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 I want a different legacy. I want a different outcome. I can't do it alone. I'm not going to try to do it alone. Jesus, I need you. Amen. Amen. All over this place. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Go ahead and put your hands down. Will you pray with me right where you are? Say something like this. If that's you today and you're ready, say, Jesus, forgive me for my sins. Today, I surrender the control to you. I give it, God. I declare that you're my Lord, Jesus. Come live inside of me and make me brand new. Change me from the inside out. Thank you, God, for saving me. Help me to serve you and live for you from this day forward. God, I want to leave a legacy, a godly legacy. Help me, God, to rearrange, change some things that I can't change. God, change it inside of me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.